الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين جاهدوا فينا لنهدينهم سهلنا سبحان رب رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم We talked about in the past that every path and every journey has its mark posts or sign posts. Meaning if you're pursuing a degree in engineering, you know that you need to take <coughs> course 101 and then course 102 and then course 103 and then course 201 and then course 202 and then course 301 and 302. And then you need to take, you know, some specific engineering exam and then you receive your degree in engineering. So every single, and you'll find this throughout life, every single thing that you want to achieve has its signpost. So similarly with the science of the cell wolf, and we've talked about these a lot in the past, that there are so many signposts on the way for the person who attains nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, the entering of the sharia in one's life. The, the ability to submit to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, developing a love for the Prophet ﷺ, developing a connection with Allah, depth of prayer, time spent reading the Qur'an, amount of days spent fasting, company that you keep, etc. Uh, the list can go on and on and on. And we've talked about some of these things in the past. But along the idea of signposts or things which show you where you are, are something called maqamat. Maqamat means your states. Another way you can translate this is your state. And the ulama of the sawwaf, the mutasawwifin, when they experienced these states, they made notations of their experiences. So they wrote down, or in, and more often than not, they transmitted to their students ideas and names for different states that they experienced as they submitted themselves to the Qur'an, the Sunnah, and the Sharia over a period of lifetime. And that's what are called maqamat. So people say, you know, may Allah raise your maqam, or may Allah grant you a high maqam. And this is one of the meanings of the word maqam. One of the maqamat that is discussed among the mutasawwifin is called maqam al-mushahida. Maqam al-Mushahida. Maqam al-Mushahida, what this means is, is that you attain a certain state in your life where <clears throat> you now have the ability to witness directly the results of your actions. So what do we mean by that? What we mean is that you attain such a degree of purity and you attain a certain degree of simplicity within your life that you're able to directly relate, directly relate act to B with, with result B, for example. If you attain a certain degree of purity in your life, <coughs> and you attain a certain degree of submission, and you attain a certain degree of simplicity, you may be able to get to the state where if you eat something wrong, you see a direct result in your actions. Or if you see something wrong, you see a direct result in your actions. For example, somebody is relatively is doing well, has, is progressing on the path, and all of a sudden they look at something that they shouldn't have looked at. And then the very next day, they don't wake up for fajr. Or the very next day, they wake up late for fajr. Or the very next day, they don't wake up with the hajjah. In that case, they know, because they've attained such a degree of simplicity in their life, they know that Act A, looking at that particular thing, resulted in a direct result which they can attribute. They can connect, they can make connections of cause and effect in their own life. Now this state requires certain, a certain basis. And the first is, is that your life be simple enough that you can relate certain actions. Now if you're if you have, you know, five things that you do wrong every day, you don't, and 
you lose some some established thing within your life, like you don't wake up for fudge the next day. You don't know which of the five things you did. You don't know if it was it my looking at this particular person that resulted in my not waking up for fudge. Was it my uh, swearing at somebody that it resulted in my not waking up for fudge? Was it my telling my mom that I don't care what she thinks that resulted in my not waking up for fudge? You have no idea. You can't connect anything with the result because you have, your life is too complicated, meaning your sins are too, your errors and your sins are too many. So the first thing that it requires is a certain degree of simplicity. The second thing it requires is that you have an established schedule. I mean, if someone never wakes up for fudge, except rarely, sometimes reads the Quran and then never touches it and is, is very, very, you know, volatile in their daily Islamic schedule, then they won't be able to detect any change. So there's two things that are required. One is simplicity within your life, and two is that you have some sort of established schedule beforehand so that you can then attribute changes to your, to your daily, uh, to, in, as a result of your daily actions. So those are the two important things. And this is why there's such an emphasis on, one, avoiding every single sin, no matter what it, uh, what it is, and two, establishing a schedule. So the first and foremost thing, if you want to succeed in achieving any of the maqams in tasawwuf, or basically another way of saying it is if you want to achieve, actually progress towards nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that you have a schedule. We're not random people. We're not animals. That when we feel like doing something, we run and do this, and then when we feel like doing something, we run and do that. The Prophet was very, very mindful of his time, was very, very mindful of the, the acts that he would establish on a regular basis to the extent that if he did a single act on one given day, he would then continue to perpetuate that act till the end of time, till, at least till his end of time in this world. For example, one time the Prophet Sallallahu was not able to pray the, uh, I think it's the four sunnahs of Asr. He was not able to pray those four sunnahs before the Asr prayer. It might have been that, or it might have been that he was not able to pray the, the four sunnah after the Ruha prayer, um, because whatever it was, it was one of these two prayers, and unfortunately it's slipping my mind, but whatever the scenario was, it occurred because he had invited guests over to, uh, to or guests had come to visit him, actually. And because he was not able to complete those, those extra supererogatory uh, rafa'as, he then subsequently made them up after Asr one day. So that same day, he, after the Asr prayer, the fadl of the Asr prayer, he made up whatever, whichever of those raka'ah he used to, he missed. After that, he used to do it every day. He used to regularly make up those raka'ah every single day. And Aisha radiallahu anha asked him why he did that. Should, meaning, should she do that as well? And he said, no, you shouldn't do that. This is because once a prophet starts something, he must always continue it. So there was this idea, and you'll read this throughout, that once you're able to do something, once you've proven your ability to do something in the eyes of Allah, then you have to, you should try to continuously do it. So this is why when you establish your schedule, you should establish it slowly and establish it in a way that you can keep it perpetual. And I mean, we've all heard the hadith, أَحَبُّ الْأَعْمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَدْوَبُهَا وَإِنْ قَلَّ That the most beloved of all deeds in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those that are adwabuha, those that are permanent, that are established, that are regular. Wa in qalla, and even if they're small, even if they're small, they are the most beloved in the eyes of Allah. So if this is not about once a week getting excited and then setting your alarm for tahajjud and then forgetting about it for the rest of the of the month. This is about a planned and carefully thought out way of improving your schedule and developing your daily life so that it falls in line with the sunnah of the Prophet So that is the ultimate goal, that we develop a schedule and we do it over time. Now, I mean, you'll find multiple books and multiple talks and multiple uh, hadith, etc., which deal with different aspects of the life of the Prophet what he read when he woke up, what he read when he went to sleep, what he read uh, at all given different moments of the day. And these are all things that we should establish within our daily lives. And then you'll find other ahadith and other uh, ulama speaking about how the Prophet ﷺ set up his daily life, what were the acts that he, you know, 
put importance on, what were the acts that he shunned, et cetera. And all those things should slowly enter our life anyway. Uh, should also enter our life. Now, <clears throat> once you've done that, or once you begin to establish that, then you have, then you are on your way to achieving this, this idea of Mokawa and Mushahiba. Because once you've established a schedule, and you've also worked towards eliminating some of the major sins from your life, then you can begin to understand this concept. There's two things that are really, really important about this. And when you reach this, you it becomes much clearer. But the first is that you, you'll read a lot of different instances of the Sahaba and the companions of the Prophet and them and the Tabarin and the Tabat Tabarin and the great Mashaikh of this um, of this uh, Ummah giving you the hints that they had reached this state. For example, we've all heard the famous narration of a, one of the uh, people of our Ummah who was memorizing the Quran. And they say that one day they were walking in the street and they merely saw the heel or the shin of a woman who was not their mahram and they couldn't memorize the Quran for 40 days and they had forgotten what they had memorized. So you'll read a lot of uh, stories about this. That one particular Sahaba, he misses uh, his uh, prayer and he looks back in his life and he examines and he finds that he did a particular thing. Or not necessarily a prayer but a supererogatory prayer. So you'll find this throughout You'll find so many stories of the Mashiach saying, I did this, and for 40 days I was not able to wake up for the Hajjid. Or I did this particular act, and I lost the ability to, to pray the Hajjid three days in a row. So they directly relate, or directly relate their actions with a result in their life. That's the first thing. So this helps us to understand some of the different narrations that we have of our Islam. The second thing that's important about this is that it, re it alleviates a huge amount of confusion that exists, especially in sort of nitpicking at fiqh. So a lot of times, I mean, if you look at the Sahaba, they didn't ask very many questions about their, da their daily, you know, what they should be doing, what they should not be doing. They were just very sort of natural people. They came in the presence of the Prophet and then they established themselves, they established a connection with Allah and they sort of went on living their lives, developing this connection, and where there was a deficiency or a defect, then they would go and approach the Prophet. So I said that. They didn't ask very many questions. They didn't get very academic about... I mean, they did get academic. They didn't get intellectual about the deen. Meaning they didn't ask questions that meant nothing. They didn't ask questions just for the fun of it. They didn't ask questions just to play mind games. They asked questions that they had sincere need to know. For example, you know, one of the Sahaba comes to the Prophet and says, Ya Rasulullah, I did such and such, and it resulted, you know, and I'm feeling distant, distant from my Lord, or I'm feeling bad about this particular thing. How do I make up for it? How, what kind of a still far do I need to make? Do I need to give charity? Do I not need to give charity, etc.? So they asked questions that directly related to their experience, to their experience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And similarly, once you get to this point, then many of the issues that we sort of that nitpicky on don't no longer become issues because your heart becomes, your heart and your life become a true uh, representation of where you're at. So if you are regularly waking up for tahajjud and you're regularly, you've established many of these sunan and the sharia within your life, and then all of a sudden you do something that has, that results in you missing tahajjud for two or three days, and then you eliminate that act and your tahajjud returns, then you have a very, very good idea of whether you should have been doing that act in the first place or not. You don't necessarily need to go and get a fatwa. Now, obviously, these have to be acts within Islam, and your experiential can never outweigh the, outweigh the sharia. But on a sort of daily basis, and for some of the petty questions that we, all, that we often get involved in in fiqh, this then becomes a, a very practical way of judging our daily acts and judging where we stand in the, in the, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anyway, this maqam is very, very important. It requires two things. It requires simplicity in your life, meaning you have to, you have to eliminate many of the sins that we do on a daily basis. There has to, those have to be eliminated. The very, very minute and sort of 24-hour consistent sins that we do, like looking at the wrong thing, eating the wrong thing, etc. And the other thing is, is that you have to establish a schedule. And until you have these two things, in fact, these two things don't result in, in the maqam of mushahidah. These two things re result in all your maqam. In any progress towards Allah, you need these two things. Number one, 
is that you have to eliminate any of the any of the sort of things that are against the Sharia that are wrong, that are errors, and two, you need to uh, establish a schedule of working towards closest um, to, towards Allah, which is a schedule of prayer, a schedule of dhikr, a schedule of learning, etc. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us such a week to establish these two things in our lives and have the chance to experience Muqam al-Mushahidah. Wa akhirna wa anna alhamdulillah alhamdulillah alhamdulillah